Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I am delighted to talk to Professor Joel Hayward. You're most welcome, sir. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, Joel, if you don't know, is a New Zealand or British scholar and author who currently serves as Professor of Strategic Thought at the Rabdan Academy in the United Arab Emirates, where he is joining us from today. Joel has earned uh, Ijazat, that's teaching authorizations, in Akida, that's Islamic theology, and Sira, the prophet's biography. He has held various academic leadership roles, including director of the Institute for International and Civil Security at Khalifa University in the UAE, also head of air power studies at King's College in London, not far from where I'm sitting, and dean of the Royal Air Force College, both of these in the UK. He's the author or editor of 17 books and counting, I think, and major monographs and dozens of peer review articles, mainly in the fields of strategic studies, military history, the Islamic ethics of war and conflict, and Islamic, especially 7th century, and Western, especially 20th century history. His recent books include Warfare in the Quran, published in 2012, War is Deceit, an Analysis of Contentious Hadith on the Morality of Military Deception in 2017, and The Leadership of Muhammad, a Historical Reconstruction. And the latter book won the prestigious prize of Best International Nonfiction Book at the 2021 Sharjah International Book Awards. Now, actually, his full biography, which is merely a brief excerpt, is very, very long and impressive. But uh, Joel has kindly uh, come on Blogging Theology today to share his knowledge and expertise about the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace. So I thought it would be good uh, as, as a first topic, a first question, really, to uh, ask about epistemology. How do we know what we know, for example, about the historicity of Muhammad and how that might compare in terms of its thoroughness and reliability when compared to the sources for other historical figures, such as Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Julius Caesar, Alexander, etc. So, Joe, what, what are your thoughts on, on that? How do we know what we know about the Prophet Muhammad? Yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, important question to ask, how do we know what we know? And I'm a historian by training. My PhD is in history, and as a historian, what we try to do is we try to look at what are called primary sources. And a primary source can be a document. It can be something archaeological, but it's a trace of the past that's created by the participants themselves. So, for example, l let's say you're, you're looking at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Uh, it would be good to walk the ground and look and see where it happened. Mm. It would be good to find out for example, where the bodies are buried. By taking, for example, a metal detector, you could find the arrowheads and the spearheads. And by looking at those, you make a determination as to what type of armor each side wore and so on. So as historians, we tend to rely on the literary, which means documents. Mm -hmm. and, and so we look, for example, at who wrote on the Battle of Hastings. And then we say, how long after the battle were those records written? Were they written by participants? Were they written by participants on the winning side, uh, on the losing side? Because that makes a big difference. Mm. Then you look at, for example, uh, so that document has survived. In what way has it come down to us? For example, has it been uh, preserved as a, a document in an archive or a museum, and we have an original copy like the Magna Carta, or is it a document that actually has disappeared as a manuscript, but we now have a printed version um, that's come down since the age of printing? And if it's the latter, if it's a printed book, what are the chances that the printed book is word for word the same as the original manuscript. Mm -hmm. so, so reconstructing the past then is a matter of kind of assembling pieces of a puzzle. Mm -hmm. And all of those sources we have to look at with what's called objectivity, which means we have to say, what are my own biases as a scholar, as a researcher, and how do I step back from those 
and approach it in a kind of a neutral and even-handed way. Now, as a religious person, when we approach, for example, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that's really complicated because we have developed a, a love of this man as Muslims and we want to see everything he does in a certain light. Mm. So when we approach a source that might reflect uh, a slightly different interpretation of an event or cast them in a different light, it presents a challenge to us as a scholar. Do we then ignore that source that might not present them in the ideal way and pretend that doesn't exist? And Muslims have been uh, guilty of that through time um, in the same way that Christians, when they approach the life of Jesus, have been guilty of that. We want to present our prophets, our, our great spiritual leaders, as idealized and as perfect. Mm. And when we come across sources that present an unusual view, uh, we don't know what to do with them. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by this is that morals change, moral positions change across time. Yeah. So let me give you an example. I, I specialize in strategy and war. And I'm aware that in today's world, if we say that somebody initiated an offensive action, military action, we tend to see that as being aggressive. And if it's aggressive, then it must be morally wrong. Right. And we say that the only people who are morally clean in war are those who are attacked. And because they're attacked, therefore, they must be right. And the people who attack them, who initiate that, mm. must be wrong. Well, that quite clearly can't be. Mm. So let's take an example to an extreme. Let's take, for example, there's a, a, a squad of, of, of SS officers defending a death camp where Jews have been exterminated. Mm. And let's say that you happen to be the Americans who are advancing in that area and you want to liberate that camp and you attack it offensively. Mm. So you've initiated a military action that's aggressive against it. But the intention of that quite clearly is to do good and not to do harm. The defenders, on the other hand, who are being attacked and are fighting defensively, not offensively, are quite clearly not able to be presented as being morally correct and, and resisting the attack. So, I mean, that's taking it to an extreme. Hmm. It's a fascinating example there. It really, it really just forces us to ask, it, ask, ask moral questions of the, of the righteousness and the justice of an action rather than just who, who is doing the actual shooting initially. One's got to ask those deeper questions of any historical conflict. It goes even further there when re regarding war. We, we, we don't see much good in war anymore. If you look at, for example, the Second World War, okay, we beat the Nazis, that's a good thing. But that war itself was a bloodbath. 60 million people died, 20,000 a day. Every day, every month for six years, 20,000 a day. Because of that, we send war through a particular lens mm. in the 20th century, the 21st century. And we can't imagine going back to a time when actually war was seen as something positive. Yeah. It was something glorious. It was something masculine and manly. It was often a rite of passage for a teenager to become a man, was to go and fight on a, on a campaign or a mission, um, to, to, to demonstrate manly qualities like courage, chivalry, uh, self-sacrifice, mm. uh, collegiality, brotherly love, all of those qualities which were esteemed uh, as, as being qualities that a person should have were, were often only found in war. Mm. And so war was once seen as by many uh, different peoples through, through the past as being something positive and not something negative. Mm. And so when you look back then at figures, for example, like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we know if we count up all his campaigns that there were something around 80 military campaigns initiated by the Islamic side of which the prophet fought 27 himself, 27 battles. Of those 80, approximately 80, most were initiated by the Muslim side. They were initiated as offensive military operations. We call them raids. Some of them were very large campaigns. Now, if we are troubled by that, we have to then explain that away. And the tendency throughout the last 50 or 60 years has been to try and explain away the military offensive nature um, of the prophet's campaigns. And I look at them quite differently and think, how would they be seen in the 7th century? 
Mm. How were they seen in the 7th century? At a time when, for example, it was highly esteemed for parties to go out and raid the camels uh, or the goats and sheep of the neighboring tribe to fight a campaign and bring those back as trophies and as booty, which provides finances for the entire tribe and is able to raise the tribe's living standard. Mm. So there's a social good embedded within that act that it's hard for us in the 21st century today to contemplate. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, the difficulty, I think, about, uh, about approaching the past and approaching the life of, of the prophet um, is that we're too caught up with our own modern values. And, and it's hard to accept that perhaps the people of the time had a different set of values. And indeed, society was very different. Arabia was effectively anarchic. There was no centralized government. There was no concept of law imposed upon the Arabian peoples. Mm -hmm. uh, every single community belonged to a tribe or a sub-tribe, what we call a clan, and they were continuously in a state of war against every other tribe in Arabia. Sometimes they would make a deal and come together for trade relations ordinarily or familial relations that two different clans from the same tribe might see for their ancestral reasons, value in coming together. Aside from those relations, which were temporary, ordinarily temporary, every Arabian tribe was at war. Mm. And so if that's the case, you have to say, what is the leader's primary function in terms of his responsibilities to his people? And the answer has to be their survival and their well-being. Now, to achieve the survival and the well-being of your tribe at a time when you're technically at war with every other tribe around you often means that you have to go out and make war on that tribe. The tribe that comes into your area where you need to be watering your camels, and you might have, I don't know, 50,000, 100,000 camels, there's limited water for them. So when a neighboring tribe, and it's a seasonal thing, they're moving across land that's close to you with their camels, in this competitive environment, only one herd or one people's camels can drink that water. So the moment you realize that they're coming towards you, you have to keep them back. And so you sally forward with a small force and you frighten them away. It might involve the loss of one or two people or perhaps none. And, and so if you look at the records of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, this is the context that you have to see it in. Right. Um, the tricky thing, uh, again, is that we tend to look at the sources for the prophet's life through a very modern and present-centered lens. Yeah. We see, and, and I saw this once the war on terror started 20 years ago, the historiography of the prophet changed, and we started saying things like, oh, the prophet was an insurgent. And there are several books that have come out in the last few years where the prophet is cast as an insurgent, trying to overthrow an unjust state to bring about a sense of justice. And, and that's today's concepts with today's values that have no place uh, in the seventh century. Mm. Okay, but the, the, uh, coming back to the question of the historicity uh, and our sources, how, how do they compare, do you think, with um, uh, our, our sources in terms of reliability uh, with other ancient figures like Jesus or Julius Caesar or Abraham and so on? Yeah, it's tricky. You know, what, what tends to happen with sources is they deteriorate very quickly. Mm. And ordinarily they are written once on animal skin, it's called vellum, yeah. Uh, like the, the skin of a baby lamb, it's stretched out, it's dried and salted, and then it's um, you write on it with ink that um, survives perhaps a generation or two or three. Mm -hmm. So there's a constant process of recopying. Now, we don't have sources from the Prophet's life, Islamic sources. The earliest sources we have date from about 200 years after his life. That allows a lot of non-Muslims, for example, to say, well, you know, how accurate can they be if they're written 20 generations or 10 generations after the man's life? Mm -hmm. Well, that is a fair criticism in a sense. But if you're going to apply it fairly, you have to apply it to the life of G Julius Caesar, of Alexander the Great, of, of Jesus Christ. Because the sources for those 
figures as well, post-date them by hundreds of years. And, and so if you take, for example, uh, I don't know, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great died in the year 323 BC. He's one of the greatest military people to have ever lived. Extremely famous, among the most, two or three most famous military people. The first, well, the oldest, perhaps that's the best way to explain it. The oldest surviving Greek source that we have mm. was written by a man called Diodorus, Diodorus Siculus from Sicily. He wrote his book 265 years after Alexander's death. Now, you might say, oh, gosh, that's a long time, 265 years. Well, that problem is then compounded by the fact we don't have an original copy of Diodorus's book. Mm. We have a copy that dates from uh, the 15th century. Gosh. So that's that's 1,500 years after Diodorus wrote it. So 1,500 years from Diodorus to the version of Diodorus that we have, and Diodorus himself lived 265 years after Alexander's death, which means there's a 1,700-year gap. Mm -hmm. Yet all scholars that write on Alexander would use this as a source. It's yeah. the same with the sources for for, um, I don't know, um, Sophocles, the earlier sources. He, Sophocles died about 408 BC. This, the earliest sources we have, the earliest copies we have of Sophocles are from the 11th century, so 1,400 years later. If you think about Plato, Plato was an, perhaps the most famous philosopher, uh, him and Aristotle. Um, Plato, the earliest sources, the earliest copies we have of Plato are from the ninth century. So that's, again, around 1,300 years after his death. Aristotle, um, 10th century, 11th century. Herodotus, 10th century. Julius Caesar. So Julius Caesar wrote his own book, his own autobiography, his campaigns, um, The Gallic Wars. We don't have a copy of, of the, the Bellum Gallicum, it's called, um, earlier than around an incomplete copy from the ninth century. Mm. So that's over 900 years after the events. It's, it's interesting, the, 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 the earliest complete copies of the Gospels, uh, the Christian Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, that we have are in the mid-fourth century uh, in the Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. And, of course, Jesus was born in the beginning of the first century, so that's several hundred years after his lifetime, and we don't have any complete copies for, before that at all. And the gap is slightly shorter, but still we're dealing in centuries, not just in a matter of a few years. Well, that's, again, where different types of sources come, come in. If we're imaginative and we say a source doesn't have to be a literary source, so let's take, for example, the life of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the early sources, so if we take a book like um, uh, Ibn Hisham's Asira and yep. the, the, the story of the prophet. Um, okay, the book itself is a copy of uh, Ibn Ishaq's own biography, a um, couple of hundred years after the prophet, but it's very specific about such things as where events took place, mm -hmm. how many days' journey it was by camelback or by horseback or by foot. If you go to Arabia now and you look for those sites and then you walk those distances from Medina to, for example, where the Battle of Badr took place, hmm. you'll find it takes exactly that amount of time on foot. Interesting. Interesting. If you go to the Battle of Badr, battlefield, it's laid out exactly as the book says. Right. It's quite remarkable. If you look on the ground and you kick your feet enough, you'll uh, you'll find an iron arrowhead will come up um, or a rusty spearhead. So you, you find physical evidence that a battle took place there. Right. Not only that, but there's a cemetery there. And it's a cemetery that's been kept and preserved now for 1,400 years. Well, if it isn't those martyrs from the Battle of Badr who's buried there, um, who is buried there? Mm -hmm. so, so there's a lot of tangible physical evidence Wow. for some of the, the key events. I was quite struck, for example, by, in the early Islamic sources, a, a story of the, the Prophet when he marched up to a city called Khaybar, mm. which was a large oasis north of Medina. And it was a Jewish town, as Medina was itself. And in Khaybar, 
He fought against the Jews who had these very large, what are called utum in Arabic, fortresses. And some of them were up on a hillside and almost impregnable. And they had to lay an extensive siege for about a month. But in the sources, it talks about one man. And he breaks down the door and he plunges into the darkness with his sword ready to strike whoever is in the inside of this fortress. And he sees a figure in the darkness. And he goes to strike, and his sword sticks into the ceiling because the ceiling is so very low. And, and then he makes a comment and says, you know, it was at that, that time when my eyes became accustomed to the, to the dark and I was able to see who I was about to kill, that I saw it was a woman. And I remembered what the prophet had said, never kill a woman. So I rejoiced in my heart that my sword had stuck in the roof. Wow. Now, what's the point of this? The point of it is this. I've been there. And you can walk in the ruins of those fortresses. Oh. And when you enter the doors of the fortresses, you're struck by how low the ceiling is. Gosh. Because they had to make it a certain number of, of stories high. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and made out of, of stone and mud brick. And so they, they made the, the, each room, each level of story, um, only slightly taller than I am. And I'm about 171 centimeters, not very tall. And so I can easily, I can, having been there, um, see exactly uh, what was described in those early sources. So that gives you some sense that you can kind of, in a sense, retrace it. You can't do that for many things in the life of Jesus. And we can't do it at all for the life of, for example, Abraham or Moses. Right. We take it on faith as an act of faith that the books mentioned them. Therefore, they probably existed mm. as historical figures. But beyond that, we can't say much more about the historicity of um, Abraham or of Moses or of David. There's no archaeological evidence that they exist. It's quite shocking when you when you study this at university, like I I I, I did, and I didn't know this, and I thought, you know, I, I remember being asked to do a, a, an essay on the Book of Exodus, you know, uh, of Exodus of Israel out of Egypt, and of course Moses was the key leader of that, and being told <laughs> at London University. There is no evidence that Moses even existed. And I thought, you've got to be kidding. There must be some evidence from Moses. And um, uh, th that really shocked me, actually. Uh, however, since then, there are some eminent historians, archaeologists, specialists in the field, uh, it, to the University of California and so on, who are actually convinced that he did exist, but perhaps not in the way precisely described in the Old Testament uh, for various reasons to do with the magnitude of the Israelites traveling across the mountains. You know, uh, it doesn't kind of make sense historically, but there are indirect indicators. They now argue that it is credible that a figure like Moses actually existed. But nevertheless, it's still indirect. It's not like they found a plaque saying, you know, Moses lived here or anything like that. Well, it, 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 to a degree, it's the same for the life of Jesus. You know, we have later sources, as you mentioned, that perhaps post-date him by a couple of hundred years. Mm. It's likely there was a man, um, and it's likely he had some type of religious mission, and uh, it's likely that that occurred in and around Jerusalem. Um, and, and, you know, we have mentions of that in such works as Josephus, the yeah. great Jewish yes. historian sure. Um, sure. who saw him as a historical figure. Now, we know that there have been insertions into Josephus. Mm -hmm. You know, we know there are words that have been added to kind of uh, add to that Christology of yeah. Jesus. That, Christian that Jesus Josephus, who, was a, who was a, a, always was known as a Jew, uh, and, all yeah. the, and suddenly he becomes a Christian when he's talking about Jesus being, you know, the, this great son of God who died for our sins, thinking, what? This doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the fact that he's mentioned at all yeah. Um, yeah. probably suggests that there was a man. Um, but again, there's a difference between what the mind can prove through evidence, mm. which is what the scholar tries to undertake, and what a believer, a religious person accepts as faith. Yeah. That, that's a challenge for the scholar who happens to have both. So, for example, if you're a non-religious scholar of religion, it's quite clear you follow the evidence, and you don't have this intellectual and emotional dilemma. If, on the other hand, you happen to be a scholar of religion who actually believes in that religion or a different religion, you have quite a dilemma in terms of the gaps in the evidence and the claims made about the people from the past. And so when I read, for example, about the life of the prophet Muhammad, 
peace be upon him, uh, whom I accept as a historical figure, whom I accept as a prophet, whom I accept as the final prophet, um, I'm nonetheless bound as a scholar to adhere to the rules and the principles of my discipline. Yeah. And I've got to follow the trail of the evidence. And, and, and so when I step back into the, into the sources, I, I've got to say to myself, what are the sources trying to do? Where did they come from? Who wrote them? And so let's take the two primary books, if you like. We have a book by um, Ibn Hisham. It's a recension of an earlier book by Ibn Ishaq. It's a biography from birth to death. Then we have another book, which is very similar by a different scholar called Al-Waqidi. And Al-Waqidi's book focuses on what's called the Maghazi, which is the, the military, the, the, the campaigns yeah. of, of the Holy Prophet. So when we look at both of those books and we ask ourselves, why were they written? When were they written? Why were they written? What was the intended readership? What's the primary message they're trying to convey? What we see is definitely a, a kind of a sacralizing tendency. Tendency. What they're trying to do is create a, an origin story for Islam. And they're trying to create an origin story for the prophet, peace be upon him. And, and so they're pushing a perspective and pushing uh, a narrative of the prophet's life that presents them uniformly in the best light, which is very nice for us if we're Muslims, um, but isn't very helpful for non-Muslims. So Muslim, non-Muslims approach that. They'll look at Waqidi or Ibn Hisham and say, not much we can get from here because these people are pushing this sacralizing religious uh, tendency. They're trying to take a man and make him into a saint. And, and, and that's called hagiography. The, the creation of a, of a saint story. Now, as a historian, how do I go into those books and try and find the historical Muhammad, peace be upon him? And it's the most remarkable thing, and it's a, it's a great fun to do. His life is immensely fascinating. Mm. But some things we have to accept have been added or changed in those sources. Now, we shouldn't feel any fear or uh, um, uh, of saying that, even as Muslims. They're not scripture. Scripture is scripture. It's separate. As Muslims, we have a book. And, and so Quran is, is my book. It's my religious text. It's a book that uh, God has communicated as a kind of a handbook for life. It teaches us about our relationship with God. It teaches us how to have a good relationship with our neighbors. That's its purpose. Mm -hmm. Its purpose isn't to teach the history of the prophet. And it doesn't even narrate the prophet's life in the way that, for example, the Gospels do for the life of Jesus. It doesn't tell his story because the people who it was recited among are there with them. They know the story. So it, it's not written in that sense. So if you look, for example, in Quran and try and find the prophet's life in the Quran, it's very, very difficult to do that. Now, it's clear that many of the verses in the Quran relate to real events. So if you read the Surat al-Anfal, for example, the, 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 the book of the spoils of war, you'll see parts of the Battle of Badr mentioned. You see parts of the Battle of Uhud, you'll see even much later battles like Hunayn and Ta'if mentioned in the same books. It's kind of all the war stuff is put into one book as a series of explanations. But we reconstruct the life of the prophet from that at great peril. And we do it through a process that's called Asbab, asbab al nuzul the, the occasions of revelation. And in a way, we're guessing at them. And what I mean by that is that the scholars for the last 1,400 years, when they come across a verse, an ayah in the Quran, that appears to talk about, for example, taking of prisoners, they will say, ah, when was the first time he took prisoners? Mm -hmm. They'll go to Al-Waqidi or Ibn Hisham and they will say, uh, okay, this is what Ibn Hisham says. That seems to fit what the Quran is meaning. Therefore, that's the occasion of the revelation of that verse. Now, it's not a scientific process. It's, it's, a, it, it's a largely subjective. It's an unverifiable process. We have no objective criteria for measuring the accuracy of that process. 
So all we have, we have scholars who say, at this time, this revelation came to the prophet. At this time, this revelation came to the prophet. And we try and reconstruct his life in that way, using from verses from the Quran with a tremendous amount of, of uncertainty. Mm. There's an awkwardness to that. And yet we have very little else. Um, the hadiths, as you know, came quite a lot later. Um, the hadiths have a normative function. They're not designed to teach history. They're not designed to teach you when something happened in the Holy Prophet's life, peace be upon him. They've been stripped out of the historical context and assembled as normative statements um, of practice designed to teach a Muslim how to act. And so they have a separate function and they're arranged in a different way. They're organized and presented mm. for that purpose um, to, to, to correct the behavior of future generations. The early historical sources have a sacralizing function. The Quran is the only book that we can say is a historical artifact from the life of the prophet, but it has very little detail of the prophet's life within it, almost nothing. And so I guess I'm coming around to the point that we, we, we know a lot about the prophet's life, more than very many historical figures and certainly more than any other major religious figure. But we know it with less certainty than it might at first seem. And, and I don't think there's anything disrespectful in saying that. Mm. It's the nature of the scholar to say, well, given that uncertainty, what are the key anchor points? What are the things that we say might be the most reliable or trustworthy? And, and so we're able to kind of take the prophet's life in a way into segments. First, 12 years of his prophetic life he spent in Mecca. Mm. Um, he, he was clearly not in a position of great strength within the tribal arrangements and the family groupings in Mecca. He wasn't a leader in a sense, apart from a very small number, 30, 40, 50, 60 Muslims that followed him. Then we, we have the second period of 10 years um, where he's made the hijra to uh, a, a small oasis town called Yathrib. Um, and, and there he's able to amass around him an ever-increasing number of people who are following his message. And, and we're able to see a few key events happening that we can trace, for example, archaeologically and establish that, well, here's a series of forts. Some of them show signs of being burned. Some of them show signs of being destroyed. We can kick our feet into the ground and we can find arrowheads and spearheads. We know a battle took place and so on. And so what it does is it takes away uh, a lot of the mythology, perhaps, but it establishes something very concrete and very real about the life of the prophet that he was a man who lived uh, in a very competitive tribal Arabia, which was largely anarchic. There was no centralized authority anywhere in the peninsula. Every tribe was at competition with every other tribe. And when the prophet starts to create this new community, what's called an ummah, uh, he has its preservation as his first driving impulse How's this new thing that I've amassed around me, this grouping of believers, going to survive? But, but that, that, if, I may, if I may just ask, uh, after Muhammad, upon him, he became a prophet, why was he seen by so many people in Mecca as an enemy? Uh, what, 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 was, what was going on there? Because he was preaching a message of, uh, well, we'll come to what is the next question, actually. What was the message that he was preaching? But um, well, why did this generate so much antagonism, even hatred from some individuals, just, just for a religious message of the oneness of God? Well, what was the dynamic going on there, do you think? Yeah, that's a tricky question in the sense that a lot of other people in Arabia believed in the oneness of God. Mm -hmm. Arabia, at that time in the 7th century, to the north, mostly Jews, so north of Medina, for example, from Medina to the border of what we call Sham, mm. um, was largely Jewish. So we have Medina as a mostly Jewish city itself, uh, or cluster of, of cities. You have Khaybar, Fadak, uh, Tema, 
uh, Makna, uh, Eila, which is what's now uh, Aqaba, um, Wadi al Qura, all of the major settlements to the north of Medina, from there up to Sham, are Jewish. Not all the people living in them are Jews, but the people controlling those towns and oases are Jews. Then in Mecca itself, you have a, a cluster of what are clearly Christians, um, very few Jews. The Christians don't appear to have much power, but they exist there. Mm. And so, for example, we know that when the prophet received his first revelation in the cave, that he came to his wife and his wife took, her, uh, took him uh, to uh, Waraka uh, in Nafal, who was a Nestorian Christian. Well, he can't have been the only one there. He was part of a Christian community that lived in or around Mecca. In the further south of, of Mecca, as you head towards Yemen, you have mostly Christians. And then as you reach Yemen, you have a mixture, about 50-50, of Christians and Jews living in, in, in Yemen. The point I'm making about this is that monotheism was very well established throughout Arabia. Yeah. Now, we have this belief that everyone was pagan, that they had a multitude of gods. And we, we accentuate this with the story that when the prophet then opened Mecca, um, after he'd been in Medina for eight years, he went through the Kaaba and smashed all the idols. So we think they must have all been idol worshippers. Well, y y yes and no. It's not as simple as that. And if we look at the text of the Quran as a book, we see that that book is engaged very strongly with the Christian debates about the nature of God. Yeah. So in Arabia, we had people who were called monophysites, and they believed that God had one nature. And there were other Christian groups that believed that God had three natures or two natures, and a, a, like a, a human nature and then a, a divinely godly nature. Mm. And the Quran positions itself even in that debate and has something to say about it. So when it's talking about don't say Trinity, don't say that God has a son, don't say three, Thalatha, don't say that. He, this is the Quran engaging with monotheists mm -hmm. about the nature of monotheism. Now, what did the prophet's mes message consist of and why didn't they like it? Mm. The answer is two things. One, the prophet believed in absolute monotheism, which meant there was one God, not that there was one supreme God among gods, yeah. but there was one God and no other gods, that there was no dualism. There was no equal and opposite type of power. Mm. Like perhaps you might find a variant of in either Hinduism or in Zoroastrianism at the time. None of that. He had a very strict monotheism. And the God that he chose was the God that was common among the Arabs, Allah, the God. But he believed that Allah was the only God, not a God in a pantheon of different gods that had daughters or sons. Mm. And so there was no allowance for that. No allowance in his mind. God was one. Don't say anything but that. But the second thing about this is that he brought a, a, piet, a, a piety and a moral strictness that really bothered people. It's like, why are you on at me about my moral conduct? Leave it out and leave me alone. Who are you to preach to me about my behavior? They found it very offensive. But beyond that, of course, I think economics and the way that humans function plays a large role in explaining why they resisted. Uh, Mecca was one of a number of uh, towns in Arabia that had a, a cultic function in that it had a shrine at its heart. There were perhaps five or six throughout Arabia that were also had things like the Kaaba. Um, but certainly this was a grand one in Arabia. And people came from all over Arabia to do different types of functions there. And the people of Mecca uh, enriched themselves quite justifiably by providing water from the Zamzam Springs and providing food and providing shelter and pilgrim garments and, and all of those things. This was a primary way that economically they survived. Mm -hmm. So into their midst comes one of their own people. Mm -hmm. And instead of saying, oh, this is all fine, he's saying, you better stop this. 
Don't you come here and, and worship God and say that God is one of a family and he's got sons and daughters. Um, and don't you come here and do uh, ritually unpure things around the building that we're trying to, to, to hold sacred. Uh, this must have been a, a, an annoying message to them. Now, how did they respond to it? The first thing they thought was that he was majnun. He was possessed by a devil. Mm. And that's the phrase they use. In Arabic, we use the phrase majnun to mean you're a bit nuts. Well, it doesn't. It comes from the same word as the word jinn. It means to have a jinn in you. Wow. Maj, maj, and the j, j, and the n, the j, and the na, maj, nun is from the word jinn. Yeah. And so the phrase is even recorded in the Quran. Mm. And we see the criticisms of the, of the Meccans uh, several times in several places throughout Quran saying, either you are a poet, and these are just words, yeah. or, or you're possessed by a jinn, which is a deeply offensive thing to say. So there was all of this type of resistance. Mm. He did have protection from his family. He wasn't himself ever physically beaten up, but his people were. Yep. He had enough status within his tribal group that the worst that ever happened is they roughed him up a little bit by grabbing at his coat once. But the people that he led uh, were maltreated physically to the point where some of them had to flee and some of them fled to Abyssinia mm. um, and, and later came back. And they fled for their safety. I mean, it was clearly a very difficult time for the embryonic Muslim community. Muhammad tried to find a, a, a town or a community that would take him in, like a refugee. Yeah. So he yeah. went on foot. He walked all the way up to Ta'if. Ta'if is on a plateau. By the time he got there, his feet were already bleeding from this exhausting work. And there they laughed at him. They threw stones at him and mocked him. And, and so he, he was finally taken in as a type of refugee by the people of Yathrib. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the people of Yathrib that came and met with the prophet at a place called Aqaba, near to Mecca, we know each of the people that came and met with them, all of the tribal leaders. Amongst all of this group, this party was about 70 people at the second meeting of Akabam, and they had tri 12 tribal leaders. Seven of those tribal leaders were literate, and they were literate because they had been taught at the Jewish school in Medina. Mm -hmm. And it's probable if the Jews in Medina, which is where the only school in Medina happened, was the Jewish school teaching literacy, and they're teaching literacy by also teaching monotheism. We've got good grounds for, for believing that those first people that came and made a deal with the prophet to come to Medina were already monotheistic and were monotheistic, not because they had converted to Judaism, but because of the literacy they had gained from the Jews and in the process learned and, and, and gained an appreciation for monotheism. Mm -hmm. So the prophet goes off to uh, Yathrib, to begin a new life in Yathrib as a type of refugee, clearly an outsider. Mm -hmm. Yet the remarkable thing about the prophet is that within uh, eight years, certainly, he had become the master of the Hijaz of mm -hmm. Western Arabia. Absolutely. In fact, by about the sixth year of the Hijra, he was already the most prosperous man, the most powerful man within the Hijaz, individually. And this is something that Abu Sufi and his great rival would like to comment on. Mm. And in the sources, we have him saying, you know, Muhammad, you are now the richest man of all of the Quraysh. Now, when I say rich, I mean that the, the prophet was a river to his people. He was given lands and, of course, to combat. He inherited, he took lands and he turned them into uh, what were, we now call a, a, a waqf. An endowment, and so he bestowed the lands that he 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 gained uh, to his people. And so, for example, he gained orchards, and so he made those orchards freely available to the poor people of Medina. So, when I say rich, I mean technically it all comes under his umbrella of of finances, where the finances are bestowed for the goodness of the people mm. in a quite a remarkable way. And and so something has. Transformed 
this kind of outcast who flees to Yathra very quickly into a tribal chieftain of some substance. And that's, I think, something that personally is the most fascinating thing for me to look. Indeed. Uh, well, 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 one of the things that interests me is how did Muhammad treat uh, the Christians he came in contact with, according to our sources? Because there's some extraordinary events, meetings with groups of Christians uh, that are um, narrated in our early sources. Uh, you know, many people, perhaps in the West today, would think that he would attack Christians or persecute them or drive them out. But our, our sources have quite a different story to tell, don't they? Yeah, you know, it, it, it applies equally to the Jews. The, the Prophet had a great respect for people that he considered the Halakitab, the people of the book, right. um, which meant, uh, amongst others, the Jews and the Christians and, and others. Uh, people of the inherited uh, revelation. And, and, and so he looked at the Christians as being uh, remarkably close to Muslims, except for one issue, and that's the issue of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And it was divisive. There's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't divisive enough to the point of persecution. In fact, you know, the Quranic revelation says that the, the Muslim man can marry the Christian woman. Now, the only Christians in Arabia at that time were Trinitarian, no Unitarians in Arabia. So this whole population, whether they're monophysites or whether they're historians or whatever they are, of whichever denomination, as we call them today, they were Trinitarian. They weren't Unitarians. Yet the Quran says you can marry their daughters mm. because of their love of Allah and because of their love of the Messiah, Jesus. So the similarities were sufficient. Mm. There were differences. And the differences are addressed directly, particularly in the, the, the first major book of the Quran, the book of the Ka'a, or Bakara. Likewise with the Jews. The Jews theologically are remarkably close to Islam. They have a concept of Tawheed that is total. God is one, indivisible, not a trinity, has no brothers, sisters, uncles, aunties, no sons. God is one, cannot be divided. This itself was enough that the prophet was good to Jews. Now, we know that there were three tribes in Medina that one after the other had a falling out with the prophet. Mm -hmm. So we've developed in our mind some kind of notion that he didn't like Jews because they were Jews. And that couldn't be further from the truth. As I mentioned, when he came into Medina, he knew he was entering what was largely a Jewish town. It wasn't a, 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 a polytheistic town with a few Jews. It was the other way around. It was a Jewish town with a few polytheistic Arabs. And he knew that north of Medina, all the way to the border of Sham, were Jews. Mm. And all those towns that I mentioned before. And yet we know this, that even after fighting against the three tribal groups within Medina, and that's over authority of the oasis of Medina. It's nothing to do with the religious confession. He maintains good relations with those Jewish tribes all over. Mm. And, and in fact, imposes upon them uh, something called jizya. Now, we know the rate of jizya because it's stated in our sources. Each person, each Jewish person was to pay to the Islamic, to, to the prophet as part of the... Um, agreement with him, mm. the, the amount of one dinar per person, which is equal to 11.5 dirhams. That's it. And if you think about how much zakat the Muslims themselves were paying, boy, it paid to be a, a Jew mm. and pay this greatly reduced amount. It was a soft and easy and accommodating amount. It was a political statement that you're contributing to the ummah, to the community. Right. It wasn't designed to be an onerous or uh, an exploitative, heavy amount of taxation. So in answer to your question, the other monotheistic peoples were treated pretty well uh, by the prophet. He was quite affectionate towards a monk, for example, or monks. And there's a, a word in Arabic means those who have the tonsure. A tonsure is when in the Middle Ages or in antiquity, a priest would shave the top of their head. You've seen Friar Tuck and Robin Hood. 
Mm. And they have this strange ring like this. The prophet thought it was very curious that they did this. Didn't stop them doing it. But he said to his people, when you go out on these expeditions and you come across them, don't harm them. Mm. Leave them alone because they're devoted to Allah. They're devoted like you cannot believe. They put themselves away in these cloisters. They deprive themselves of the earthly pleasures to be close to Allah. Leave them alone. And so that was the position. Mm -hmm. And likewise, for example, during the Battle of Haba, he fights against the Jews there. And then he imposes upon them. They come to him and say, look, can we cut a deal and stop all this fighting? He says, yes, of course. But you have to pay the jizzy. They say, we'll pay it. Then they say to him, you know, you've taken our holy books, the Torah, all our scrolls you've taken. And the prophet says, what do you mean? They're missing? He then sends his men out to find them and says, return them. They're the books of God. Return them. Now, he doesn't say, oh, these terrible books, you should stop reading them. Hmm. Because they're the books of Islam as well. They're the books of, of revelation. And, and he's, he's upset that his people have done something with them. Um, so they quickly recovered and handed back to the Jews of Heba. Mm. It's actually quite a beautiful moment. Mm. And on that question, uh, uh, towards the end of, uh, of the Prophet's uh, life, the, the conquest of Mecca, of course, a very famous event. Um, what happened there? And, and what does it tell us about Muhammad as a political and military leader? Because one would assume, uh, from a certain Western point of view, that well, when Muhammad actually conquered Mecca, his home city, his hometown, uh, defeated his enemies, what would he do? I mean, some people might say, you know, oh, he, he, he would have slaughtered them. Of course, that's what he would have done. But interesting, at, at the height of his power, when he had the power to impose his will militarily on his enemies, his bitterest enemies in Mecca, what, what, what actually happened uh, on, on that occasion, according to our sources? Well, uh, again, it's, uh, it's hard to know exactly. The sources are quite detailed, but clearly there's been a, a lot of colouring in the sources. Um, that you know, there's a, a very uh, symbolic, rounded-up figure of ten thousand soldiers that marched from Medina um, to Mecca. Uh, you know, there's a highly improbable figure, and the fact that it's exactly ten thousand and rounded up perfectly, and yeah. each of the composite not parts one, not are one numbered. Thing. Yeah. You know, it's not 10,001, it's not 973, yeah. it's exactly 10,000. Well, but it's a large force. Let's say whatever it is, it, it moves up. It, you know, it, it takes a week and a bit to get there. The Meccans are freaking out. They know he's coming. Abu Sufyan, the, the leader of, one of the leaders of the Quraysh, goes to the Prophet. He's one of, one of, the, enemy, this, one of the enemies of the Prophet, of course, or the arch enemy. Well, enemy. He, it's a strange thing you say that because... I'm very fond of Abu Sufyan. His name is Abu Sufyan, the son of war, Harb. And his father's name was War. People think that it's a, an epithet to insult him, that uh -huh. he somehow loves war. Mm. Um, no, it isn't. It's an esteemed name. His father was a great warrior. Uh -huh. So his father's name is War. And so Abu Sufyan, the son of war, it's a tribute to his father. He's the prophet's second cousin. He's 10 years older than the prophet. He's a very grand figure, a very noble figure, a very dignified man. The prophet's terribly impressed by his personal bearing. And so when he comes to the prophet, the prophet is sweet to him and says, Abu Sufyan, isn't it time that you said, La ilaha illallah, that there's only one God and that it's Allah? And he says, I say it, cousin. I say it, la ilaha illallah. Then it's interesting. They say to Abu Sufyan, uh, the prophet says to Abu Sufyan, but what about me? What do you say of me? And, and Abu Sufyan says, look, I knew you when you were a child. Mm. I don't know. Hmm. You know, I don't know. Now, this is when the prophet is immensely powerful. He's moving forward with thousands and thousands of men. And this Quraysh tribal leader who's led two or three major attacks against him is saying to him, I believe in your God, but I'm not sure about you, oh cousin, because I remember you as a little boy. So you would think that this would offend the dignity of the prophet. He'd be angry. 
the prophet left it at that and didn't demand uh, the recognition of the prophet uh, as a prophet. So uh, there's an agreement takes place. We don't know how the agreement takes place where the prophet says to Abu Sufyan, go home mm. and tell your people that this won't be bad for them uh, if they seek your protection. And Abu Sufyan was a tribal leader and a tribal leader at that time had the right to declare uh, safety, the, the safety of their people. And in their name, the other tribal leader against them would have to honor that. And Muhammad did exactly according to Arabic tribe, tribal custom. He honored Abu Sufyan's declaration that the people beneath me, Abu Sufyan, are safe. Mm -hmm. The phrase is, those in my home, those who are in my house. And it doesn't mean literally, physically, his own little private space. It means the people beneath Abu Sufyan are safe. And so the Prophet, when he gets to, to Mecca, he divides his force into three or four great columns. One goes down to the south. One goes in through each of the two western gates, and one comes from the north where the Prophet himself is, peace be upon him. And the, the, the Meccans, except for one small group uh, of resistors, um, all submit. And the Prophet calls them all together in front of the Kaaba. And all of the men come in a great mass of, 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 of Meccans. And all the females come all clumped together as a separate group. And the Prophet from the steps of the Kaaba says, what am I going to do with you? And it's like a rhetorical question. And they, they're clever. You see, we, we, we forget that they were monotheists there and that they knew scriptures. And, and so they appealed to him on the basis of uh, of, uh, of uh, like what had happened in the Bible when Joseph, um, with, Joseph with his brothers with, with, with Joseph and his brothers and he so he repeats the scripture mm. and says you know you are forgiven and there's no harm upon you this day mm. and and they rejoice in that and and, and so it's quite a, a moment of reconciliation what he does then is he takes the the bayah, the pledge of allegiance of all of the men they come and they shake his hand and he asked two things. The bayah is involves two, two things. One is to listen and to, to what's required. The second is to obey what's been asked. So the prophet says, come and listen. They all come and listen. And individually, he shakes their hand and, and they promise to obey. And to every man, the prophet added the phrase, well, as best you can. You know, they say, oh, prophet, we promise to obey you. And he was kind of soft and said, well, do your best, the best you can. But the interesting thing is that some of the men are reluctant to make the bayah to him or reluctant to become Muslims. And there had been this triumvirate of leaders in Mecca who had actively resisted him. And to each of them, the prophet extended forgiveness. Now, the curious thing is that there were a number of death sentences that had already been preordained upon some of the Meccans. And so... The prophet expected that those people would be found somewhere that probably still be intransigent or stubborn and, and wouldn't accept. And among them was a woman called Hind uh, Binti Utba, who was actually the wife of Abu Sufyan. Mm. And her son, her, uh, her father and her uncle had all been killed in the Battle of Badr. And she had uh, sought vengeance against uh, the prophet and had been uh, uh, instrumental in having the prophet's uncle Hamza killed and mutilated. Um, and, and, and so there was a death sentence hanging over her. Now, the curious thing is she came in amongst all of these women and she was covered um, with, a, with a niqab. No one could see who it was. And the, so the prophet started saying to the ladies, now, ladies, it's your turn to make the bayat to me. We won't do this with a handshake. You do it with a pledge to me and I'll accept that. So he says, but I have a few requests for you. you. You know, you are not to bury your children in the sand. Don't kill your children. And this voice calls out, well, you've just killed our sons and our brothers. Who are you to talk about killing? The most disrespectful thing you can imagine. And the prophet is patient and continues and, and talks about, and men, be, be just to your wives. And, and this woman calls out, 
Well, what if my husband uh, is a stingy man and he won't give me money from his wallet? And the prophet says, well, then you can take some, but only take what's required and fair. Then this man calls out from the audience and says, oh, messenger of God, forgive my wife and her big mouth. <laughs> Who is it? It's Abu Sufyan. Oh, really? Which means that the prophet immediately knows that this woman who's being very disrespectful and heckling him mm. is Hind bin Utba, who's got a death sentence upon her. And he says, is that you, him? And she says, yes, it is. And then he says, and you are forgiven. Mm. And she was struck by that as if lightning had hit her. And later she talked about the powerful effect of the fact that she was still bitter. She had been heckling the man uh, who had taken her city, who had killed her son, who had killed her father, who had killed her uncle. And he says to her, you are forgiven. And she felt forgiven. Mm. And she became a very great Muslim, uh, as did Abu Sufyan. Mm. So this, this moment of healing uh, was quite remarkable. But there were some who nonetheless were stubbornly held out. And one of them came to the prophet and said, can I have three months to make up my mind about you? And the prophet said, sure, take four months. Take as long as you, as you like. Others fled. Some went to, uh, uh, to uh, Jeddah. Some went down towards the Yemen. And the prophet sent riders after them. Tell them to come back. They're forgiven. And some of them, you know, there was one of them was uh, getting a boat, wanted to cross across the sea to Abyssinia. And a friend came and said, I finally caught up with you here. Thank goodness the prophet sent me to get you and fetch you back. And he said, am I going to be killed? He said, no, you're going to be forgiven. Come back, talk to him. He's going to forgive you. And so in that moment, there's this kind of remarkable uh, healing. Mm. And, 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 you know, from there, they had to march out to Hunayn to fight a very great battle. Mm. And so the prophet even took on his campaign many of these people who weren't yet Muslims, some of them who hadn't made their pledge of allegiance to him were still holding out. He said, come, fight, get a share of the booty. They're like, you want us to join your, 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 your military? He said, come. And so they went out and were transformed mm. by the sense of trust. And, of course, then they won the battle, they got booty, and they received it. And so they were, you know, by every measure of Arab custom, they understood that they were fully incorporated Mm. Um, has truly forgiven allies of the prophet. Remarkable, remarkable story. Now, these days, uh, there are many sira, these uh, it's the Arabic term for biographies of the prophet. And um, I have uh, three here that I have from my library. It's the first one I ever read, a uh, book by Karen Armstrong, a British uh, writer called Muhammad, a biography of the prophet. Um, it's actually a great book. And the second one I, I read, one of my all-time favorites, I've been reading from this regularly on my channel, actually, Muhammad, his life based on the earliest sources by Martin Lings, a beautiful literary uh, biography. But possibly the most uh, popular in terms of sales and readers is, of course, this is probably the most well-known, the sealed nectar biography of the noble uh, prophet. So, um, what, in your view, is the best biography? Uh, um, there are many others, of course, than just these three. It's interesting that you presented those three. It's quite remarkably uh, kind of serendipitous. The first biography I ever read of the prophet also was Karen Armstrong's. Oh. She's not a Muslim. She's no. this very book. You know, after 9-11, Islam was considered to be something quite grossly disreputable. And I wanted to understand why that was so. And so I, I, I found this book and read it and was overwhelmed with admiration mm. for the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And I was struck by the fact that someone who was clearly not a Muslim could write so wisely and affectionately about a man she had no reason to mm. speak positively of. Mm, mm. Um, as Muslims, we, we have this awkwardness uh, when it comes to a source that might say something controversial mm. about the, the prophet. A non-Muslim doesn't feel that nervousness. They will just go for it. And, and yet Karen Armstrong's book was such a positive book 
in my life, it's it's quite scrupulously impartial, mm. um, and and is very well researched. It's as well researched, in fact, in terms of the Arabic sources, uh, although she read them in translation, as the second book, Martin Lings's book, mm. um, is. And Martin Lings's book is based primarily on Ibn Hisham and Al Waqidi, yeah, and to a lesser extent on Ibn Saad. It's a very fine book. Mm. The problem with Martin Ling's, of course, is that a source doesn't need to be believed just because it's an Islamic source. Mm. It still needs to be critiqued, interrogated. And Martin Ling's had such a reverence for Ibn Hisham and Al-Waqadi that he isn't able, wasn't able, God rest his soul, to to get amongst the sources, to see what, for example, might be plausible, what might be implausible, to see between those two great sources what contradicts. And there are clearly contradictions between the early books of Sira um, that we need to explain. Mm. Some things are said quite differently. Some stories are told very differently. And that needs to be reconciled. And, and so the, the floor, if you like, of, even of uh, Martin Lings's book, is that he takes everything um, within Ibn Hisham and Al-Waqidi as a literal truth, a historical right. truth. And, and that's the dangerous. He's not a historian. Um, he's a very great scholar of theology. And so he's telling a theological story about a man he admires very much. And it is a very fine book. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend it to uh, anyone that ever expresses interest in the life of the prophet. Read Martin Lings's book. Very good. Mm -hmm. The third book I hold in low regard, The Sealed Nectar. Um, it, it's not a book of historical reconstruction. It's clearly a book of, uh, of, of... It's telling a very sanitized and cleaned up story of the prophet's life with all the awkward bits that historians wrestle with taken out. It's cleaned up. And it's cleaned up to the point where some things make no sense. And where to get to the point where he wants to get to, he actually has to do a kind of a sleight of hand and hide what the sources say. And so he will be sticking strictly Ibn Hisham, Ibn Hisham, Ibn Hisham. And then he comes to a point where if you read Ibn Hisham, there's something controversial. And the seal nectar doesn't mention it. It hides it from readers or it will tell it differently to what the source says. Mm. Now, a historian can't do that. Mm. A historian has to take a source and explain it as it is, with all its imperfections. The only book that might be an exception to that is the Quran, if you are a religious person, a Muslim. But the books of Sarah, they're not scripture. Mm. Any Muslim has the right to investigate them as a book. They're just books that are produced not by the divine, but by the human. These were human minds trying to explain a great man. But the books that produced can be critiqued. And so the sealed nectar fails in its job. Right. Um, yet it's, it sells tens of millions of copies a year. Yeah. Oh, three copies are dis distributed massively all over the world. Amazing. So uh, um, is, is there a biography that does meet the criteria that you outlined there in, in your knowledge, in English, I mean? Um, I think the two, actually, that you started with are the ones I would recommend. Right. Karen Armstrong's book um, is really very good. Mm. Um, and Martin Ling's reconstruction based on the earliest sources is also very, very good. Um, you know, the Sarah needs to be rewritten again. Mm. Um, you know, revisionism in that sense is a healthy process. We know a lot more now. Right. We know a lot more, for example, about... <laughs> the nature of monotheism in Arabia at the time of the prophet. We know a lot more about uh, the tribal structures and the allegiances and the alliances that existed. We know a lot more from archaeology, for example, about the battles of the prophet. Mm -hmm. It's right and proper to, to be retelling the story with a, an eye on fidelity, with an eye on truth to, to the sources as they're emerging. And, you, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, we now know 
is that we can go beyond the books of Sarah to reconstruct the prophet's life. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. There's books by scholars in Arabic, medieval sources, on things like taxation. And you might think, so? Well, here's the thing. When the prophet first came from Mecca to Medina, he came essentially like a refugee, a very powerless fellow with a small number of people. And he arrives in Yathrib where there's a small number of followers already there, the, the so-called Ansar, the, the helpers. So what happens is the people that he finds himself uh, amongst, uh, they're called the Khazrash tribe. They say to the prophet, every piece of land in Medina that is not currently irrigated, we give to you. We give it to you as a gift, as a gift of love. And so immediately on arrival, the prophet became a landowner. Hmm. Try and find that in Martin Lings's book. Try and find that in Karen Armstrong's book. Try and find it even in Ibn Hisham or al waqidi not mentioned. Interesting. Where is it mentioned? It's mentioned in medieval books, Arabic books, on things like land ownership, on inheritance and taxation. And so the scholars of today are using an imaginative approach to the Sarah by saying we're not stuck by just a biography of the prophet based on earlier biographies. Let's go to the books that talk about inheritance and see what inherit what gift, what the prophet gave to his own children, what he gave to his own wives, because it's all written down. And then we find out, for example, that uh, when the prophet took, for example, Heba and took his uh, Khums, his fifth of the spoils of war, uh, what did he do with that? Well, we know from the books on taxation how much he gave to his wives, how much <laughs> land he gained. And so the new books of Sarah are starting to include uh, different types of sources, including things like taxation and inheritance, things that ordinarily the historians of the prophet's life wouldn't bother looking at. No. And they're finding uh, the richest types of, of matters to comment on. Wow. And so the, the story is being told anew. Mm. And it's the most wonderful thing to be part of in my, my own uh, kind of humble way to contribute something perhaps that's fresh uh, to, to the story of the prophet. Well, on, on that very point, actually, my, my last question really to, to you is about your future work or your ongoing work that's not perhaps yet in the public domain in this regard. Uh, I understand you you have actually completed a book on the prophet uh, yet to be published, I think, or be published soon. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I just did this book called The Leadership of the Prophet. Mm. Um, and in that book, I tried to say, okay, we, it, it's inadequate to say that the prophet was a great leader just because he was a great man or just because he's a prophet. As Muslims, we take it for granted he's great at everything. Why? Well, because we're Muslims and we believe he's great at everything. That doesn't necessarily mean it's so. And we have an obligation as scholars to go to the sources to say what made him a great leader. What skills did he have as a leader? What were his attributes? What's his understanding of human nature? How did he motivate people? How did he deal with the fear of, that people had? For example, the fear of death in battle. Mm. And so in that book, I tried to start from a different point, uh, foundational point, and say, okay, I'm a Muslim as a writer. I, I do love this man very much. He is my prophet, but I need from the sources to know what made him a good leader. Not just to say he's the prophet of God, therefore he's perfect in everything he does. Because that's a meaningless explanation. It's a very nice one, and it's fine for us as believers, but it's worthless to anyone else in the world. The other three quarters of the world have nothing. They can learn about Muhammad if all we say is he's great because he's the prophet. There's nothing for them. And, and I wanted my scholarship on the prophet to be useful to the world in my own humble way. This is, you know, a repayment of what God has, has given to me. So that book I've now finished, that's published. That's now out and it's, it's doing well. Alhamdulillah. I've now just finished a very major book that I've been working on actually for 11 years. And I call it The Warrior Prophet. Muhammad and war. And what I've tried to do in that book is something similar. 
I, I can't just have a start point as a historian and say, well, I'm a Muslim. I love the man. He was God's prophet, so he's masterful at everything. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he just simply must have been the greatest of generals. Mm -hmm. that, that won't do his explanation. I have to look at how the prophet understood this thing that we call warfare. And warfare, as you know, is a highly transformational process. It changes humanity more than almost any other collective activity, for good or for worse. So how did the prophet see that? And then how did he use it? Because he had a goal. He had a goal for the future that he wanted for Arabia and beyond. How are you going to bring people on that journey using warfare to bring about the future you want? And so, so that book, I've invested 11 years of my life into it. Wow. I've had three goes at writing it. The first time I wrote it, I wrote it. Uh, for a publisher and promised it to them, I don't know, 2010 or 2011. Finished it and hated what I'd written um, because I knew I was perpetuating an, something that I couldn't sustain um, from the sources. So I completely scrapped it and started again around 2014. And by about 2017, uh, realized I had to start it again a third time. Alhamdulillah, I finished it and I'm happy with it as a book. Um, and I hope it says something fresh about, about the prophet and war. And I don't feel any sense of embarrassment um, that our prophet saw war as a transformational process. War has that ability. Mm. We know it, for example. You take the 20th century. The great war of the 20th century was the Second World War. We saw Nazism and Hitler as something to oppose. And off we went. Mm. And it's called the good war to this day. War isn't always necessarily wrong or necessarily bad. And so if that's so, I asked myself in the writing of that book a series of questions about what was it the prophet was trying to do? Um, how did he understand the ability of war to bring about something positive, even though it's that most harmful of activities? And, and so I looked. Firstly, at all of these different raids, and when you read this series, you see the prophets constantly sending out these uh, small raids. Sometimes they had 100 men on them. Sometimes they had as few as 8, 12, 15 men. Often the purpose was to go and uh, capture the camels or the goats or the, the, the horses of another tribe to bring them back as booty. It was a way financially of building a sustainable economic system, um, but it was also, beyond that, uh, an expected societal function of a chief. And we forget that the prophet became a tribal chieftain and, and certainly was recognized as a chief among a number of Arabian chiefs of power until he became the paramount chief in Arabia. So what do you do when you've got 14-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old, 17-year-old young males full of testosterone who have to be given something to do. What are they going to do? And these are rough people. A lot of the Bedouins and even the city dwellers of Arabia were rough people. Violence was part of society. It was endemic. And the prophet, therefore, has to channel that effort. And so he sends out all of these raids as a way of teaching them courage, personal discipline, teamwork, teamship. Uh, brotherhood, self-sacrifice, all of these qualities that sit at the heart of Islam, at the, sit at the heart of the best of humanity in any society. And, and so warfare had a societal function. It was transformational in the sense that you could take young men and give them something purposeful to do that was societally enriching um, and was good for them as individuals. Then you've got these big raids and campaigns that happen. And you see, again, the, the, the prophet is trying to pull the future towards him, or a better way is to try and pull his people towards the future of saying, we're going to have a state of peace. This system where Arabia is lawless and every tribe is at, at war with each other, mm. we're going to fix that. But it's going to be hard for a few years. But trust me, if you follow me on this journey, 
soon we're going to get to a state where there's one people in Arabia. And guess what? We're going to be so united in our beliefs and our way of seeing the world, we won't want to be fighting each other. And we're going to have security. We're going to be prosperous. Um, and we're going to be, for example, literate. Um, and we're going to be God-fearing. But the journey to get there is going to be tough. It's going to be a struggle. And as you know, the word in Arabic for this exertion and struggle is jihad. And, and, and so those are the concepts that sit at the heart of that book. Mm, mm. Inshallah, it's with the publisher. Hopefully it will come out uh, very soon. And so this, this, will be and, English, this will obviously be in English. Uh, yeah, it will be in English, but it will get picked up in Arabic. I mean, a lot of the books I've done have had, you know, Alhamdulillah, they've turned up in, in different languages. I've just had a, a, a book done on Bosnian uh, as a translation, several already in Arabic oh, yeah. and, and other languages. Um, the book I'm, 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 I'm writing at the moment uh, is a follow-up to my book on the leadership of Muhammad, and that's a book I'm calling The Diplomacy of Muhammad. Mm. Now, that to me is really important because Muhammad was a, a good commander of military forces, if you want to call them that, using today's phrase. But he was an even better diplomat. Mm -hmm. He intuitively knew what the tribes around him wanted. And he intuitively knew what to promise them to get what he wanted. And so his statesmanlike qualities, his ability to negotiate what today we would call hard bargains, tough deals, is extraordinary. And dip diplomats now use a range of tools. They use coercion, for example, which is if you don't do something, there's going to be a consequence you won't like. Do we see that in the prophet's life? Yes, we do. And he does it very, very well. Um, he often gets what he wants from a, a, a resisting or a troublesome tribe with a, a kind of a, a threat is too strong a word. Um, but uh, an awareness, they're given an awareness of the consequences of, of, uh, of holding out and not, uh, and not reaching agreement with them. Inducement. As I mentioned, the prophet became wealthy. Mm. And we're uncomfortable with that because we, we, we like to think of a suffering prophet. It's a model of a prophet. We have a, a, a view as, as believers that a prophet is someone that's uh, kind of uh, taken away from worldly concerns and money isn't part of their life. Well, it was part of Arabian life. And so, for example, in Arabia, the tribal chieftains were people that were able to demonstrate great largesse, which meant money flowed from them. In Lawrence of Arabia, there's a lovely phrase where one of the tribal chiefs says to all his people, aren't I a river to my people? Hmm. And they all say, yes. What did he mean by that? He meant that everything he accumulated for himself, he gave to his people. And, and here we see the same thing in the prophet's life. He accumulated a, a fortune. He was the, the Bill Gates of the seventh century Arabian Peninsula, but not for his own benefit. And in his private life, he lived very frugally. But in public, he had to be a chief. He had to be seen as grand, as an accumulator, and as a distributor. And everything he got, he gave. And part of that, he gave to win over the people he wanted on side. And he did it at the heart of his negotiation was inducement, often financial inducement. And even that sits uncomfortably with some Muslims because they think, well, you know, taking money, for example, to become a Muslim or to submit to the prophet, that doesn't sound very good. But... If you think about the prophet's motive in doing so, he saw it quite differently. In his view, you were either with him or against him. And he didn't want people against him because there were consequences for that. The primary one, which is they'll go to hell. And in his heart, he has compassion for all the people. Mm. He feels a great sense of commitment to God to save as many people from the fires of hell. So he wants to bring them into his fold. So his view is... If I get them listening to me and they listen to God's word, the revelation it will work on their hearts, how do I get them as a first step to listen to me? I know what these people like. 
they like the pleasures of the world. I can't give them uh, the things that are immoral, but I can give them some of the things that actually God doesn't frown upon, one of which is worldly goods. I've got lots of camels. This guy, this tribal chief, he's holding out and he's stubborn. But if he wants my camels and I give him a 1,000 or 2,000, I might win that man. And if I win that man, I will win him to the position where God's work can begin to change him from within. And so at the heart of his diplomacy was this very nuanced and careful use of inducement. And so uh, this book that I'm doing on diplomacy, I, I likewise think that um, by looking at the prophet as an exceptional diplomat, um, it's a very modern concept. And I'm kind of, I know it's anachronistic to say he was a diplomat, but um, those skills of negotiation that he had, whatever you call them, uh, is over the last 15 or 20 years of looking at his life as the thing that I think, in fact, he was best at. Um, he, he was remarkable at understanding people. Mm. And, the, you know, the military stuff, it's all good and well. He was good at that, but he was exceptional mm. at diplomacy. Mm. And I think that's something that's been largely ignored by scholars. And so hopefully I've got something to say that people might find interesting. So mm. that book I hope to have done by year's end, inshallah, and then get that off to the publisher. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, beyond that, I have a whole range of ideas of, of, mm. of, of books. You know, one of the things that I read once in the New Testament is a, a verse attributed to Jesus where it says, to whom much has been given, much is required. And what it means in a sense is that if God gives you some type of skill or ability, he wants payment in kind, in a sense, with that. He wants you to give back with that thing. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I don't have much in life. I'm not very good at many things. But this stuff that I do, this scholarship, I, I seem to be okay at it. And so it's my sense that I, I, I want to keep doing it as a way of mm. uh, giving back what, what I've been given. And, you know, as a historian of Islam, it's there's just it's never ending the things that you can find if you go looking. So, inshallah, I think I've got a couple more books. I don't know how many um, that I, I, I want to contribute. Fascinating. Well, I certainly look forward to seeing those, uh, particularly the one uh, you, the most recent one uh, you're working on or have just finished on diplomacy. Because uh, I, I agree, it's a particularly fascinating area of, of study where he, he showed remarkable. Uh, skills uh, which have much to teach us today um, obviously so so thank you very much indeed Professor Joel Hayward uh, for your expertise your time which I know is very valuable I know it's quite a bit later in the UAE than it is here in in London in the afternoon here so I appreciate uh, staying up so late as well um, I'll, I'll link you have a website of course so I'll, I'll perhaps I'll link to uh, that in the description below so people can um, discover more of your uh, literary output, which is considerable, um, and, uh, and, and, and read it for yourself. So uh, thank you, Joe, for your time. Much appreciated. Until next time. It's been a great pleasure. And, I, you know, I do hope we can speak again on, on something similar. It, it, it's for me, it's a, it's a great joy. I mean, I, I, I do love my prophet. Um, I, I do love my religion. And uh, as a historian, uh, it, 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 as I mentioned, there is this kind of moral dilemma about how to engage with the sources. Mm. But even so, it's the most fabulous thing to meet people like you that I can, who are interested. Mm. Um, and, and so it makes it all worthwhile for me. So I'm enormously grateful to you. Well, that's very sweet. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Joe. And until um, next time.